that we have an educated uh, community in the apartment industry, and that is you. So thank you for being here. I want to first thank you. Secondly, I would like to thank Jim Caston and the Caston Long team. If everybody with a red shirt from Caston Long could raise their hand and let's give them a round of applause because they've been a lot of work to put this together. Now, show of hands, and I know there aren't very many of you. Show of hands, who is actually a member of the AMA right now? Hey, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Thank you. We're really thrilled that you're here. Um, the purpose of today's meeting is basically to get us all up to date as what's going on for properties uh, 150 units or less. We may go a little higher, we may go a little lower, but hopefully we're going to touch upon everything that you need from, uh, from our speakers today so you can walk home more educated knowing about where you want to buy your next apartment community. We have sponsors today. Of course, Cast and Long, thank you for being our primary sponsor. We have, yeah, give it up for Cast and Long again. We have attorney Denise Holiday, who's going to be a speaker, Hall, Holiday, and Holiday. She's right back there, raised. There you go, Denise. Thank you for being a sponsor. And then lastly, our third sponsor is, you may have seen it at the front table, uh, Smoke Free Arizona. Show of hands, who is familiar with Smoke Free Arizona? Okay, that's exactly, that's exactly why we're sponsoring today's event. Smoke Free Arizona is a project between the Arizona Multi-Housing Association, Maricopa County, Department of Health Services, Arizona Department of Health Services, and the American Lung Association. And our job, our job, because we're paid to do this, our job is to educate apartment owners statewide about the advantages of going smoke free. What are the advantages for your, for your community? Let's face it, every time you turn an apartment that has a smoker, it costs you more. Matter of fact, three times as much as it does to turn an apartment with a non-smoker. So in the back of the room, and by the way, that's just tip of the iceberg, tip of the iceberg. In the back of the room, you're going to find a conversion kit. This is like gold. I'm gonna tell you right now, this is gold. <laughs> Take this with you, because this will tell you what you need to know to convert an existing property into a smoker-free property. And by the way, if you're sitting there saying, I'm not going to go smoke free because I know I'm going to turn away some potential, some potential tenants, I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't happen. Matter of fact, even your residents who smoke don't want to smoke in their unit. Unless you're going to tell me you have a senior housing community. Then it's another story. But please take these with you. Give us a call. There's also a business card back there for Sharon Hosfeld. That's lit there. They're right next to the, the stack. Give Sharon a call. If there's a way that we can help you, let us know. Um, preferably, we would love for you to join the AMA and then, of course, go smoke free. Now, having said that, uh, thank you again for all being here. We have some great speakers. I'm going to kick it off right away. Uh, our very first speaker today is Corey Woods. Uh, show of hands, who is from Tempe? All right, then those of you in Tempe, you know Corey Woods. He is your former eight-year uh, eight city council person. He was also vice mayor before leaving office. Uh, he is currently deputy chief operating officer for Asian Preparatory Academies. And so with that, um, let me just say this. Corey has always been, while he was in office and before and beyond, the go-to person. Uh, he was always the first who wanted to be educated on an issue impacting not just our industry, but any industry. He never walked into a city council session unprepared. He knew the issues and he knew why he was voting the way he would vote. And that is the sort of person we like to see elected to public office. So please welcome Corey Woods. You know, frankly, given that introduction, I might as well just go home now and just say, look, let's just leave it as it is and move on. So thank you, Tom. Really appreciate it. And what Tom did not say is before I got into politics, I, I first got elected back in uh, July of 2008 was that Tom was one of my political mentors. He was one of the people that I used to go to before I even got on council at the ripe old age of 29. And a lot of you think I'm 29 right now, but I'm almost 40 now. So I mean... I look younger than I actually am, trust me. I mean, when you're on council, you age in tree rings. It's just kind of, it's part, it's part of what happens. So, but I wanted to thank Tom as well for his support and for offering me the chance to come out and say, say a few words today. Also, I gotta say hi to my good friend, Marge Thornton, right over here. Marge was another person when I first got into the political world who was always incredibly supportive. And if it wasn't for people like her who actually believed in me and kind of what the vision I was trying to bring to the city, I would have never gotten the opportunity to serve for two terms. So I had to say hi in a very public way to her too. 
since I'm short, I'm going to do this. Yes. <laughs> see, he knew what he's like. Oh my god, I hope this short guy gets on the stage. No one can see him. The video can see you now. Ah, <laughs> look. I'll try not to say anything too incendiary. So, a couple things I wanted to talk about today. Um, one was kind of, you know, we talked a little bit about civic engagement. Tom kind of brought that subject up. But also just sort of about the impact of apartments and kind of multi-family multi housing in the city of Tempe. So I want to actually start on kind of the civic engagement thing because I want to piggyback off of what he talked about. How many folks here, because I mean, you all, you own apartments, how, how much interaction do you have with your renters when it comes to civic engagement and voter participation? Does anyone have a lot of conversations about that or like when someone's actually moving into the apartment or perhaps when they've been there for a period of time, do you develop a relationship? Is there ever any conversation about that? <laughs> See, right, so they're politics, yeah, like, they're, they're core, I like to avoid politics as much as possible. <laughs> and I'm not, not, I'm not saying you should go in and have extremely political conversations with folks, but here's what I am going to say. One of the things about city life, and about, frankly, a person, any person who's an elected official is, many times, it really is a squeaky wheel issue. <clears throat> Apartments and multifamily units many times get a very bad rap from folks because they say, oh, apartments are bad. They just encourage transients. We don't want those kind of people in the neighborhood. I'm sure this is all stuff that you've heard before. I heard plenty of it during my eight years as a council member. And my perspective was always, well, why is that the case? The reality was I lived in two or three apartments before I bought a home in Tempe. I would, I would move back to it. Frankly, I'd like to get rid of my current home and move back to an apartment, honestly. Because um, it's my neighbors. Um, but, uh, <laughs> They're not here, they don't know. Um, but I mean, so, and it's also, you know, for a lot of folks, whenever we talk about things like the knowledge economy, uh, I work at ASU now, people who graduate from the university, these people aren't leaving the university and immediately buying homes. Many of them, frankly, don't want to buy homes at all. The new generation, the folks who are millennials, I'm technically a Gen Xer, but the folks who are even a little bit younger than me, a lot of them have very, very different priorities and living standards, frankly, than I might have and that my 77-year-old father might have. A lot of people's perspective, you know, many years ago was owning a home is part of the American dream and it's something you have to do. It's a rite of passage. But I think what happened is many times people actually look at millennials and say, oh, they don't want commitment and they all got participation trophies and I can't stand those kids and get off my lawn and all this stuff. Actually, I'm kind of getting more like that as I get older, too. But here's the thing. I think people don't give that generation many times enough credit. Because see, here's what I think happened. A lot of those folks, whatever, who were 23, 24, 25 years old, probably saw their parents who at one point owned a home that they actually thought was worth something, that perhaps they pulled all the equity out to put in a pool or to do something else. And then, of course, when the housing market tanked right around you know, early 2007, they lost a lot of their money. I will tell you a very personal story. I bought my home, you can all groan when you hear this, I bought my home in December of 2006. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you can imagine the tears that come down my face every time I look at Zillow. It, it hurts my soul so much that I literally blocked it from my phone. So, I mean, I don't think it's that a lot of these you know, people, I, I call them kids, but a lot of these young folks and young adults, it's that they have very messed up priorities or messed up values. I think, frankly, they're learning from a lot of what they saw. Now, there are still a lot of them who do want to purchase homes, but a lot of them would rather an apartment life. They'd rather say, look, if I can go somewhere and be somewhere for 12 months or for 18 months or two years, and then at that point kind of reassess and reevaluate where I am, that's much better. I've got a much more flexible situation if I choose to go down that path. I had a person just yesterday, I was driving out to a meeting with another person I work with at ASU Prep. He's talking to me about his, about his wife. We're roughly the same age. He's like, my, my wife and I have decided we both work at ASU now. And the issue that we're having, Corey, is you know, talking about moving from the West Valley and potentially selling the home and moving here. But what he said was, what our concern is our kids are in their kind of early teenage years. And we just want to make sure that we're not making a decision to purchase a home when we really don't frankly need to. And as a matter of fact, my wife and I have both talked about the need to downsize and move into an apartment probably somewhere in the downtown Tempe area at the point that the kids are out of school. So this is a person right around my age who once again has a very different value system. But it's not a value system that's based on ignorance. It's a value system that's based on observation and frankly having a different set of priorities and life goals. 
So going back to the civic participation thing a little bit more, and here's why I kind of brought that up. One of the challenges we have many times as council members, and I heard it a lot during eight years, it's the folks who come to the meetings who typically many times get what they want. Now, I'm not saying the council members don't have convictions. We clearly do. I've got plenty of them. If you want to stay with me for an hour after here, I'll tell you all of them. And I'm just kidding. I couldn't get all my convictions out in under an hour. But, I'm just, but what I'm saying is that, like, if you don't show up to meetings, if you don't email council members, if you don't call people, we don't really know it's an issue to you. We just frankly don't. And so sometimes what ends up happening is we have folks, and I, and I deeply respect the folks who are longtime homeowners in the city of Tempe who own homes 30, 40, 50 years. They're the reason, one of the big reasons why Tempe is such a wonderful place to live in. But the reality is too, there are folks who are living in apartments all through Tempe, and frankly, they are just as good as the folks who are living in homes that they own. But the problem is many times the folks who are, who are renting aren't taking an active role in the civic process. We just don't hear from them. So many times, I mean, so you could look at like, let's say the downtown Tempe area and see the big West Six Towers. I mean, it's two huge towers that are pretty much 98% leased. We never, ever, heard from someone who lived in those buildings. Whenever we were having an issue with the downtown, whether it was regarding parking meters or downtown festivals or special events that shut down the street, I can tell you who did come out. There were folks who lived seven miles south of that, weren't even near the downtown, but had this tremendous interest of what was actually going on at Millen University on a Saturday night. But the people who actually lived in those towers, who were the apartment folks, they didn't say anything to us. And so many times the problem is, as council members, you start this, this two, this a couple different kinds. One kind you say, well, I guess it's just not that big of an issue to them, so, okay. And sometimes it really is just the fact, and I'm just being honest of, I don't want to have to hear from these other people anymore, so I'm just going to vote the way that they want, and hopefully those other folks who haven't come out are fine. It's just not the way that it works. So I would encourage, if there's some way to do it, and I'm not talking about having overtly political conversations, you know, Lord knows that in this last year we've probably all had enough politics for the, you know, for the next 10 years. So, but if there is some way that you can actually have that kind of conversation with folks who live in your, in your buildings, your properties, in a way that's casual and not overbearing, obviously, but, but explain to them, you know, this is how, this is Tempe, or whatever city they happen to live in, this is how city government works, and frankly, this is how things get done. And if you see an issue where you see the council perhaps enacting a piece of public policy or a piece of legislation at the Capitol that you think is frankly bad, you gotta, they gotta speak up. They gotta come to the meeting, they gotta give me a phone call, they gotta obviously send someone an email and let them know some of the concerns. But I wanna say this too, let me just double check my time, because you know, one thing that we always say is, people in politics, or people even former politicians, uh, given a microphone and unfettered time is a dangerous, dangerous proposition. Uh, something else I'll say though, and I'm going to try to take some questions here just in case. One of the things that I've really seen in the community, along whether it's on Apache Boulevard where you're seeing big developments, or whether it's in other parts of the community where you're seeing smaller developments, smaller apartment buildings coming up, smaller townhomes, they are really improving the overall quality of the city. For people like, you know, like my friend Marge in the front row here, we can tell, I moved here in 2003. People can tell you, frankly, what some of the situations with Apache Boulevard were many, many years ago, 20, 30 years ago. When you would talk to folks of the police force or the former police chiefs, they would tell you the calls for service in areas like that were tremendous. The crime, the drugs, the prostitution, all the things that were going on there that we don't want going on in any part of our community, frankly, many times were falling along that stretch of land. One of the things that you've seen now, and, and, and I'll tell you, I'm not going to say it's completely all the way done. I mean, uh, Apache's still undergoing a major transformation. But one of the things that you can see, if you drive down that way and start over right around Mill and head down 13th and keep going east, you will see that a lot of that area has been completely redeveloped. And frankly, I don't care what anyone says, I think that what's there now is a heck of a lot better than what was there before. It's a much nicer area. You don't have the calls for service and the crime issues that we had at one point. 
because the area has been activated by, by hundreds, if not thousands of people walking around, eating, shopping, and just sort of, you know, joining hands and commiserating with one another. So I frankly think all those things that are going on and that have gone on in recent history are good things for the city of Tempe and for our future. The other thing, frankly, from an apartment standpoint, from my perspective, you've got all of these new industries moving into the city of Tempe, and this I know will probably matter to everyone out here in this audience. You see the huge state farm development out on Rio Salado Parkway, largest Class A office you know, complex built in the history of Arizona at one time. Where are all those folks going to live? A lot of them, same thing as I was talking about my friend who worked at ASU Prep. They're going to come out here, they're going to say, you know, I don't exactly know if I'm going to be here for a long duration. But maybe I'll be at State Farm for five years. Maybe I'll be here for 15 or 20. Perhaps I'll be here for two. But a lot of those folks, some of them may choose to buy a home. But a lot of those frank folks say, I'd rather just have an apartment. I want to see what's going on in the community. I want to see if Tempe truly fits me and the vibe that I want to experience. And who knows if I'm going to be here in five years. Maybe I'll be somewhere else or the company will ship me off to another location. You look at the growth of my own employer, ASU, largest public university in the entire United States of America. We were just talking about some of the numbers. I mean, over 80,000 students, whatever, clearly pushing towards 100,000 between all the campuses. And if you try to, you know, drive around the Fulton Center around 4.30, you will see there's clearly a lot of growth happening in that area. But the fact of the matter is a lot of those students, the same thing. They are looking for places to live. They're looking for places to study. And a lot of times, you know, and without, you know, sort of, you know, folks like yourselves who are clearly, you know, supporting the multifamily industry and obviously building high quality apartments and high quality rentals, a lot of those folks would have no place to live. You know, when I was 18, 19 years old, I wasn't buying a house. I didn't know what the term capital meant when I was 18. I thought it was probably in D.C. or something. I didn't know it was about money or infrastructure. So the fact of the matter is, you know, we in the city of Tempe are trying to serve a whole group of people, you know, whether it's from, you know, young folks who are ASU students, people who are immediate college graduates, baby boomers who are retiring, or folks who are frankly just looking to downsize. I have a good friend who just sold a home in, in South Tempe, kind of south of Guadalupe Road, sold the home for over $600,000, now lives in an apartment right around 6th Street in downtown Tempe. Her and her husband said, look, we don't need this 2,500 square foot home anymore. The kids don't live here, it's too big, we're getting older, and they rent. And they love it. And let me tell you something. This is how, I told you about the, the envy I have, whatever, from my perspective, even as, I went down to see her one day. We were hanging out at her house, she showed me around, showed me the entire complex. Then, we just sort of go down the elevator, walk down the street, next thing we're at a bar, having snacks and appetizers. And I said, man, I wish I could walk out of my home and actually walk right into this kind of life. And a lot of the apartments in the downtown or in the surrounding neighborhoods around the downtown, you had that kind of life. People were able to walk downstairs, get on their bike, walk, get on their skateboard, and commute right to the downtown area where a lot of the action's happening, down to Tempe Beach Park if they so choose. And so frankly, I think that a lot of what's happening in terms of the, the multifamily boom that you're seeing right now is extremely positive, not just for the city of Tempe, but for the entire valley and for the entire country. So I appreciate everything that you do and, and greatly support it and think it's wonderful. And just, you know, as I said, once you know, I'll circle back and I'll take a couple questions, I guess, but I'll circle back. If there is something you can do from a political standpoint without having to get too political, and you can let some of those folks, whatever, who live in your units or properties, and, and I mean, I don't care if you just give them the number to City Hall or give them the link that sends an email to the entire council, because there is one. Trust me, I know many people who used it. Um, give it to them. Let them know if they've got concerns about things, whether it's related to crime, whether it's trash pickup, whether it's the streetscape, whether it's taxes. I don't care what it is. But as long as we can get those folks more involved and more connected with what's actually going down at the city, the better off everything will be and the more your industry will continue to flourish as we move forward. So since I, I've got a few more minutes here, about nine actually, wow, that wasn't too bad. Marge, I'll go with you first. Well, it isn't a question, Corey, but I'd like to clarify something. Yeah. I've had independent rental, oh. <laughs> I've had independent rental owners uh, meeting at my house once a month, mm -hmm. and I hate to tell you, but most of them don't own apartments. Mm -hmm. They own homes. Mm -hmm. 
that they rent out an entire house. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanted to mention that yeah. because you're focusing on the multi-housing. Right. I, I own apartments, but <laughs> most, oh, most, of them do. <laughs> most of them no, do. No, you're right, and I, would, and I would say the same thing to a person. Uh, who clearly is a multi, who owns a number of different single family homes. We've got plenty of those people in Tempe as well who own, uh, I have a good friend who actually lives in the Chandler area who owns five or six homes in the same neighborhood in West Tempe. And so I would encourage her to do the same exact thing that I'm encouraging all of you to do today. If you've got folks living in those houses who you know and you have someone of a relationship with, encourage them to you know, become an active participant in the community. And I'm not saying that they already are. But typically what ends up happening, and I can say this just from my own anecdotal experience, a lot of the folks, you know, the people that we used to typically hear from on city councils were homeowners. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. They have just as much right as anybody else, but I would say the same thing, that the renters who live here, who are paying taxes here, and spending a lot of money in the city to keep it propped up, they also should have equal access to City Hall with the folks in elected office and equal access to the levers of power. So I would say yes, either whether it's apartments, whether it's people who own a lot of single family homes, I would you know, give the same level of encouragement to get involved. Anyone else? Why could that be a crazy story about whatever happened to me when I was on council? Why did I retire at 37? You know, so, because I wanted to sleep, that's why. You don't sleep when you're on council. You, you stay up at night thinking about zoning cases. So, I, I still do that. I drove around. I was driving around one day with a uh, now ex-girlfriend, and this probably has something to do with it. Uh, <laughs> driving around, looking at um, all the red signs indicating where the zoning is taking place, and I was like, "Hey, I wonder who's the attorney on that case." She's like, "Are you serious?" I'm like, I, "I'm sorry, I can't help it. It was eight years of my life." You know, you still do that. <laughs> Anything else? Well, look, I won't. If I'm done a little early, that's great. I won't, I won't you know, kill, fill, you know, just fill space, whatever, for the sake of filling space. But I wanted to once again to thank you. It's about 80 people strong here today, and that clearly shows your level of commitment to the community and commitment to the industry. But just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to listen. And frankly, you know, feel free to contact me anytime. You can find me all over the internet. So okay. thank you so much. <laughs> City of Tempe, and before I introduce Jim and walk off the stage for the rest of the evening, I just want to put in one last political plug, and that is, if you are a member of the AMA, please go to our website. Corey nailed it when he talked about political engagement and involvement. We need you, and right now we need you to give a $10 contribution to the Political Action Committee of the AMA. Why? Because once we hit a certain threshold, we're considered a super PAC, which means we can actually write larger checks. Why is that important? Because believe it or not, that makes a difference. And all we ask is that our elected officials pick up that phone when we call so that we can educate them on an issue. Not every elected official is like Corey Woods who wants to be educated on every issue no matter what. A lot of them just need that extra little bit of encouragement to pick up that phone. We need you. Go to our website, uh, azmultihousing.org. Uh, go on, you'll see right at the very top, Political Action Committee, click on there, donate $10. We need you if you're a part of the industry. Having said that, it is now my pleasure to introduce our partner in producing this, uh, this economic forecast event, Jim Kasten, founder of Kasten Long. He and his team have worked so hard to put this together. So with that, please welcome Jim Kasten to this. <laughs> town hall event. I get to sit down, kind of be casual about this. Uh, my partner here for the presentation, Linda Fritz Salazar. Uh, when did you start uh, your career in uh, your career? Uh, 1992. I started, oh, 1992 I started Marlin Commercial Realty with uh, a friend of mine that I had met when I worked for the Arizona Bank. And uh, we started uh, Marlin Commercial and we just sold apartments. And we did that from 1992 to 2010. And after eight, nine, and ten, and things were like, 
holy smokes, what am I going to do here? I had four people working for me. I called it the boutique uh, firm, like you see. And um, one was my husband. I said, you're not doing anything, go home. And two people were, should have retired a couple years ago. And I said, well, it's having retirement. And then I thought, what am I going to do now? And it was like Jim called, and he had just left Remax and started his own company with Jay and Long. And he said, you know, we've known each other. Why don't you come over here? And I said, door closed, window opened. And so I've been with Jim since 2010. Yeah, and Linda's a pleasure. Now, she's always in the office at 9 o'clock. I can count on her to be there. She leaves at 5. It's like a regular job. It's, it's great. And thank you for always being so consistent. Oh, yeah. yeah. So a couple of things. Uh, first of all, it's great to see everybody here. You know, when you start this and you put out an advertisement that you're going to do this event, you don't know if anybody's going to show. So thank you, everybody, for being here. I really appreciate it. This is great. And a lot of people I know, some I don't. Just, does anybody not know Cast and Long Commercial Group? Does anybody out there not know us? Who, who knows us? Who has worked with us? Who knows us? Got yeah, a bunch of hands. All right. So you know kind of that my philosophy is to provide as much research as we can. My, I will always do this for people. Arms down, palms up, whatever you need, we will find it for you. It's the same as we have for the goal for this division with AMA. I want to thank uh, Tom for letting me partner with AMA. This is great. Thank you to Gianna Jordan, who's the membership chair, for a lot of the work on setting this up. Um, uh, Jennifer, who's our office manager, who two, who two gals are out there that were greeting you. Thank you to them. And so, and then my entire group is here, and we put on these shirts. So after the event, um, if you have a question, you can't, you don't know who we are, ask anybody in the maroon shirt, we'll be happy to help you. Um, Chris Norton is, is one of our IT guys, also a Cracker Jack uh, agent. And Chris is on the IV, or uh, IT stuff here. Uh, IV, probably. Um, that's, after well, the that's after tonight. <laughs> so what we're going to do today uh, is go through kind of the overall view of the market. Uh, we will give you some suggestions as to what we think you might get into for if you're buying, if you're on the fence of buying or selling, give you some thoughts back and forth. Um, this will be followed by Scott Treby. He's going to talk about things to, what are you going to talk about, Scott? Uh, things to, to help you with cash flow, increase income, decrease expenses, uh, tenant retention, uh, preparing your property for sale to get the maximum value, things like that. And then we've got three great panelists. Um, we've got the uh, uh, Holiday and Holiday. Where, where are you back there? There you go. She's going to talk about uh, Landlord Tenant Act things. Uh, Joe Calloway uh, talked about 1031 situations. And then Bob Myers, probably saving the best for last, is how to take a C class asset and turn it into a gold mine. I mean, he's great at that. He's doing some of that. We're actually one of the clients we have sitting here that just flew in uh, for this event. So let's go to the next slide. So in, if you don't know us, we are, Castle Long Commercial Group has developed into now a full service commercial real estate company. We do all aspects, but our focus since 1998 has been on apartments, and we do this on steroids. Um, and we, re we recently partnered with AMA again. I appreciate the, uh, uh, the partnership. Uh, and the hope is that if this is a successful thing, if everybody likes what you hear tonight, that we will do this on a quarterly basis, give you a market update as to what's going on. So this is our specialist with IT, right? <laughs> <laughs> so That's he right. I, he I was, told you that we needed more time for the run through. <laughs> That's why he's going on the IB after the meeting. Yeah. So this is fun. So Chris was telling me like like earlier this morning, he said, you know, you can put the, the control for the presentation on your phone. I go, Chris, I'm old school. I just want to say next. <laughs> um, so just some credibility. Again, we've been doing this a long time. The agents have sold a lot of properties, a lot of dollars worth of properties. Thank you, Chris. So, no, the goal. So again, here's here's the thought with this division of the AMA, uh, and it was surprising to learn from Tom when we first started talking that the membership of AMA is only like one percent apartment owners. No, no, one percent independent rental owners. Small independent rental owners. 
And small times, Todd is defining, I heard you say 150 or less, I think I put down 250 or less. Um, it's the people that are the, the, that run the apartments and have some activity with their apartment on a daily basis. Would that be fair? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, the thought of this group then is to be like an invaluable resource. Whatever you need, um, we will help you get that resource. And as we go through this evening, I'm gonna point out people that offer other services that, that what we do, that you might actually talk to them after the presentation is over. All right, so let's get into the market. And just to add to that, we're going to be really open to what you want. So if there are things you want discussed, if there are issues that you think need to be addressed, uh, maybe not tonight, but email Jim, email me, email anybody in a red shirt, and we can include it in our quarterly meetings. I think that's, we want this to be about you folks. Okay, so these are the topics that we will in general cover. Uh, the last one is going to be the, the portion for Scott. So we're going to start with market trends. Um, so this is, and everybody knows that uh, uh, apartment sales have been on steroids. It's, it's the favorite thing, uh, discipline that's going on, not just in Arizona, not just in Metro Phoenix, but across the country. We have hit a mark of 390 apartment sales in 2016. That's a record setting. And when I say apartment sales, I'm talking apartments with 10 units or more. Yeah, 10 units up. And, and a lot of the data, as I mentioned, I would give reference to people who provide the data to us. It costs me a lot of money for the data. Um, some of this data comes from CoStar, which is also LoopNet, which bought apartments.com. Gina Ducey, if you're in the crowd, stand up, please. Red rest in the back, if you want to know something about CoStar. There's Gina, talk to her at some point. Okay, so not only did have the sales, number of sales gone up to a record level, so the prices, um, staggering prices. If you look at prices, say, from 2010, where we were at a little more than 40,000 a door, now we're at 100,000 a door. Just amazing to me, um, because in 2010, we were thinking, is this market ever going to come back? What are we going to do? And look at it. It has just been on a roller coaster up, 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 and up. And uh, I mean, you all know if you bought, when you bought, what your units are worth, or if you don't, give us a call. But it's just a dramatic increase because the apartment fundamentals have been so good. So I, I met a fellow come in that just came down from Portland. Is it Rick or, or Robert? Who was I? Who did I just talk to? Right. Stand up here, talk to him. So he just came from Portland, and the comment that you made uh, to me about the values and prices of apartments in uh, in town here, what do you say? Let's speak loud. Well, I just talked to my Portland office. Talk to my Portland office today. We are down for a C class in the three to four cap rates. You're probably at 150 to 200 thousand a door in some parts of Portland for a class B, C property. I just saw fourplex go on up in the northwest area, which is a nice area for over a million dollars, $1.1 million. So you have room to grow. That's a good thing. Where, where are your rents on a, on a square foot? Well, it's hard to say on that. They're all over the place, but the rents, the landlords keep raising the rents. In fact, there's been a huge fight in the city of Portland that you've probably seen about rents, rent control, caps on rents. It's quite a political fight, in Portland being somewhat of a, shall we say, Progressive City likes to get into that big time. I'm sure Corey would know what I was talking about with that, but uh, it's hard to say what they're a square foot, but I've seen anywhere, you're probably about $2,800, $3,000 for a single bedroom downtown, kind of on the outskirts of Portland, for a 800, 700, 800 square foot apartment. And Seattle's even worse. So uh, that, thank you, you got room to grow. And, and that's an important point. You, you, the folks that come from other states, other cities, um, can echo that as well. We are underpriced compared to some of the surrounding states and cities around here. Just amazing. Um, next. And a, and a point we need to make here is uh, we were in the industry in, in the mid-2000s and we, had, we saw fairly strong uh, appreciation of apartments. But what we didn't have back then was a fairly strong appreciation of rents. This market has had that. We are on steroids for rents going up. The new construction is hit about 220 a square foot, 225 if you include the rents and common area costs. 
Um, the C quality properties have gone from 70 cents a square foot maybe to a buck without doing anything. From, and all of you owners, uh, tell me if I'm wrong or if you can agree with this. 1992, it was like a one bedroom apartment running for 525 and a two bedroom apartment running for 625. And it was that way until the early 2000s, where it went up a little bit. But I swear, it was just steady, 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 even though your expenses were going up. Well, we hit here in 2010, and it just shot up. Because, number one, there aren't enough apartments in the B and C and D um, categories. People like you are taking care of your properties, and tenants are being forced to pay more. And the nicer your property, the more they're willing to pay. So you can see those numbers, and it's just, just to me, it's, um, it's amazing. It's a good time to be an owner. Um, when I've talked to some tenants looking for apartments, the horror stories of them going around and, and, and owners or managers won't return the calls, they don't care, they, they're just treated like not very good people these days. It's, it's very difficult for a person looking at the sea of big properties to find a place sometimes. Um, so, as we go through tonight, I'm going to put some like notes of caution and things that are maybe of concern. So I'm going to hit one of those on the next slide. So we've had, we saw all the rent growth was increasing, nicely increasing, continuing to increase. But the rate of increase has just a little bit tailed off at this point. That's my red arrow on the side there. It's just something to be aware of. Um, and you know, you can't go up forever. And so some of those, that, that, that increase of increase in rents has now tailed off just a little bit. So just be careful of that. Next one. But we are sixth in the, uh, in the country in major metropolitan areas for rent growth. 4.6% rent growth year over year. That's a lot. That's a lot. And, and, and in the C properties, we can see 10, 20% all day long. Oh, easily, yeah. There was an article that came out yesterday that... Um, the city in Maricopa County that has had the most rent growth of all, it's a surprise. It's it surprise. It's surprise. It's yeah. surprise. <laughs> um, next slide. So, um, one thing that just to, you don't need to see this or read it, uh, I just wanted to make a point, two points actually. We will have this slide presentation posted on our website, the klcommercialgroup.com. You'll have that as you go out. Um, and hopefully maybe AMA might have this presentation on, on their site as well, we'll see. One of the points to make about this is the metropolitan area, Phoenix, is divided into many sub-districts, sub-markets. So we actually track vacancy and absorption and new construction in every small area of Phoenix. What you're, what you're hearing tonight is just a, a grand overview for the time we have. Next slide. Again, this is a... a, a Kind of a slide you can't read. I don't care. It'll be um, in the in the handouts or, we, or on the website for the for the presentation. But just to give you an idea, we track every little area. So now let's talk about new construction. What do you think about new construction, Linda? You've asked me this for five years, and I tell you the same <laughs> thing every time. It's not going to affect us because we we emphasize B and C properties. The Class A's have really not affected the B and C properties. Um, and one of the nice things, and I was on the uh, panel for the CCIM IRAM uh, presentation a couple of weeks ago. Um, great turnout, and uh, so I was sitting next to all these folks that, that develop um, uh, new apartments, big, big apartments. And that's what they do for a living, and actually a lot of the new apartments that are being built are being sold. Oh, absolutely. Every one of them. Everyone will um, be stabilized, leased up, stabilized, and then it'll be sold because a developer develops, a builder builds and he needs the money then to do another property. So you'll see it happen. It's just going to continue. So is it a good thing if you're an apartment or that you have a B or C property in, in the central part of the town and some big 300 unit new building apartment complex gets built next to you? Is that a good I'd thing? love it. I'd love it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, because they're going to come Where's in and uh, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're getting uh, $1,800 a month for a studio. Uh, you know, it's $2.20. And so do you feel bad about moving your rent to a dollar five a square foot? No. And you know what? The tenants are happy to get your place because you keep it nice and clean and safe. So uh, one of the uh, comments we had when I was on the panel was uh, 
you know, the, the new apartment construction comes in, and what does that drive? Well, now the retailers go, well, geez, I'm going to start a coffee shop right next because I've got 300 more people here. Now I've got some other retail places down here. So when we see a big apartment complex coming into a neighborhood, yeah, there's a little more traffic congestion, but the things that they bring with it, the, the other additional businesses, are, are just great. Can you go next? So again, I, I want to uh, point out uh, people that, that provide data to us. Uh, some of the new unit, new construction data is prevented, presented by Brett Zinn from Yardi. And now, did, I didn't see Brett. Did it, can you stand up? Oh, okay. Yeah. So Brett's our, our, our local rep for Yardi Matrix. Um, they provide great data. It used to be Pierce Island. They, they now were bought out by, by Yardi Matrix. So again, if you're looking for somebody for data sources, um, talk to uh, Brett after the meeting. Um, the point is, and this is an interesting thing, and I mark this, um, so we have a, a, about a 10 year history of new unit construction. And I put down in, in September of, of 2008, this is when Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy, when the, when the government stepped in to help everybody else except Lehman Brothers, and that was like the mark of the economy falling down. There was still a number of apartments in the process of being constructed, so we still had a fair amount of new construction over the next year or two from that date, but then there was no money for, for construction, no money for building, and that's why it died in the, in the 2011, there was like 614 units, that's, a, that's a, like a nothing. And then we've had a steady increase. We are at, uh, in 2016, there were 8,034 units constructed, um, and a little less projected for the following year. Can I talk about Vegas? Yeah, um, what we've done is taken that um, similar slide, or that same slide, and then we've added the vacancy rate. And you can see the vacancy rate, is that what I'm seeing? Yeah, the gray. Yeah. yeah, the gray. And if you can see that line and then look at years, it was, it was way up in 2009 and then dropped like a stone. Um, and we are now just over 4%, someplace between 4 and 5 um, and so it, it just has been a dramatic, has a dramatic effect on what's happened. So one of the questions that is asked by a lot of people, for the people doing the new construction, will there be overbuilding? Are we going to see an increase in vacancy start? Are we going to see uh, pressure on, on rents because of the overbuilding? Um, so let me take a shot at this chart, I, or this graph, or this story, as I try to make some sense out of this for everybody using my numbers. So, um, as we stand today, 8,000 units about completed in 2016. There's 12,000 units under construction right now, 54 projects. Uh, we have others that are planned that will probably get built, and then we have 9,000-ish. That will that are kind of in the preliminary rezoning and things like that. So there's forty some thousand units in the pipeline. Um, and before I get too heavy in numbers, I'm gonna we're gonna try to do something here. And and I hope this works. Chris promises me this will work. But <laughs> on our website, you can go to our website and see exactly where all the new construction is. So Chris, if you can do that. Sure. This is neat. Yeah, yeah. Well, if it works, it's neat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need a mic? Uh, oh, yeah. Thank you. This is Chris Norton. He's our, our one of our agents and also very uh, specialized with IT intelligence here. So hopefully this will work. This is interesting if it works. Right. So we do track a lot of data, as Jim said, and we track this regularly. And we have a couple of interactive maps on the website. You're going to see the first one about new construction. And we have another map we'll talk about the apartments for sale. When you come to this map, off of the website, it looks like a big blotchy mess, but if you zoom in, that's because we're trying to show you areas where the units are being built. And the closer you zoom, those hot spots turn into pins. And once you get down into the details, it becomes more apparent. When you find these pins, you can click on any of these, and you'll see a little street view, you'll see the status. Is it under construction, planned, or perspective? Uh, who is the developer and the owner? Uh, is it a rental type of market rate? Is it affordable? What is the project going to be? So there are ways to filter this by the type, the submarket, the unit count, and the owner name. So if you really want to get a flavor of who's doing what in the valley and where it's happening and what is happening, this map is a great tool. So can you filter this and show where 
uh, the new construction is currently taking place right now? Uh, you mean things that are actively under construction? Yes. Yes. All I need to do is just filter by under construction. The map changes again. And as I zoom in a bit, I can see, like for instance, at Aridera, you can see all the ones that are just under construction rather than perspective. And then you can filter those out and just put the ones that are planned. Correct. So if somebody wanted to know if there's some new construction that's going to go on in their neighborhood, they, they can filter that and find that, right? Absolutely. So if you go to the website and you want to know, well, what's happening in my area, then you use it that way. It doesn't have to be under construction. You don't have to say, oh, geez, look, they've broken ground. And are they apartments? You can say, what's planned around me? It's, it's really a neat tool. Thank you, Chris. And we'll come back, and Chris will do another great job, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, and we'll go to the next slide. Um, So let's talk about what's driving the new construction. Okay. Um, in a very simplistic answer, what drives new construction is population. There, I, it's everything, there's nothing else that's important except increase in population to, to, su to supply the new construction. Obviously, population is driven by job growth, diversified economy, a great climate, 365-day uh, airport, business-friendly uh, resources. Thank you, Corey. Did Corey leave? Anyway, thank you for the government for doing that, uh, and, and no natural disasters. You know, it's great when you hear the, the, the hurricanes and the snowfalls and, and uh, the earthquakes and stuff, and, and we just sit here with, with no real natural disasters. We complain when it rains for two days. Yeah. <laughs> we complain when it gets down to 60 degrees and say it's cold. You can always tell somebody from Arizona. I, I just all the time. So let's let's go. So population. In about 2008 or 9, the projection for population growth was still positive. It was maybe like a half a percent or maybe one percent. Um, in about 2010, 11, and 12, it grew to about 1.7 percent. The latest projection now is 2.3 percent population growth. If we take the Maricopa County um, as about 4 million people, 2.3%, um, 93,000 people coming in per year. That's net gain, too. So the, I think the next slide then... And I'll make some, try to make some yeah. sense out of that with the next slide here, Chris. Well, oh, oh, here's some other... Uh, job growth. Uh, lots, of, lots of jobs coming online. You've heard that. A lot of industry coming in, and one of the things that Corey mentioned with State Farm, we've had corporate relocations coming into the city. Um, Phoenix, Metro Phoenix, is on steroids right now for growth. Next. Diversified economy. Again, you don't need to read the small print. We're led here by education and health services and professional and business services. That's the big, the blue and the green, the bottom left there. Next. Okay, so here's I'm going to start my, my number crunching. You guys just try to stay with me on this. Um, one of the things when you're you know, a former engineer type of person and you, and you work with numbers, what do we do for a living? We sell numbers. We, sell. we, we sell numbers so people can make money out of, out of things that they're investing in. You, and you'll hear me say this often, you don't own apartments because you like to fix toilets. You own apartments because you want to make some money. So we need to talk about what's going on <laughs> with numbers here. So again, I'm, I'm going to say we had 93,000 93, new residents coming in per year. That's the 2.3% times four million. Roughly, about 20% of the people in a city live in apartments. 20 to 25, maybe a little higher. It's probably grown a little bit with the millennials yeah. uh, bailing out. On average, if there's about two people living in every apartment, and, and these are gross numbers, but it's a big picture, um, you'll need 9,300 new units per year. We're only building 8,000. So it seems like we're not going to have overbuilding. In fact, we're going to increase the demand. However, next. We went through this last night and I said, wait a minute. So here, here's it. Now bear with me. So I know it's numbers and it's tough to do numbers. Um, so the problem is you 9,300 9, new units needed, but all those of the people, of the 18 some thousand people that are coming in here, there's not that many that can actually afford the $2.20 a square foot rent. So there's only a portion of those that are going to fill that Class A. So 
I think there will be some overbuilding. What do you think? I agree. Yeah, in certain areas, North Scottsdale, uh, Chandler, maybe South Scottsdale. I'm not sure about Tempe. Tempe's just going gangbusters. But there are areas, and we're seeing we're seeing that already. And then one of the the, 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 the thing that we see all the time is the sea quality, the the. the 60s and 70s built block constructed C quality properties that are already at, at almost zero vacancy. I mean, the only they have, they say report 95 percent occupancy. They're really the only the five percent is just for time to turn the units. What's happening with those other folks that are coming into town that can't afford the Class A apartments? They're going to down. They're going to be in the more affordable rent range, and those properties are already at maximum occupancy. So what's going to happen when you have increased demand? Well, two things. You're going to have increased rents, number one. And the second thing is locations that have been uh, on the periphery, maybe substandard, maybe haven't been desirable, because we're going to have to, we, we need those units, those areas are going to improve because you, you folks as owners are going to go in there, clean them up, and you see the opportunity to raise rents and make money. Not only cash flow, but appreciation. Those two things, in my mind, are going to happen to Phoenix. So you want to see quality apartments, you're, you're in great shape. Um, and we'll have Bob Myers talk about uh, what you can do with the, the older C properties that, that can be repositioned to get the higher rents and, and be gold mines. So evidence of the new construction coming under some pressure now for rents and occupancy. Here's five areas. Now these are these areas where we've had a lot of new construction. So you're up to nine nine percent uh, concessions based on average rent um, already in places. So this is starting. This is just starting to creep into the market here in the last. Quarter. So again, evidence that, that the new construction is going to come under pressure. Now, it was interesting that there's one property that's offering no concessions at all, and in fact, they're increasing rents. And where is it? No. Oh. Over on the west side. Oh, oh yeah. Good year. Surprise. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. Where they haven't had any new construction. No, they haven't. And and uh, Goodyear has over 700 units planned for this year. So you hear it on TV, I forget that guy's name, West Side. Well, uh, we're going to see a lot happen here to the West Side. What do you think is going to happen to rents on the West Side for the, for the oh, sea quality they, stuff? They have to go up. They have to go up. They have to. I mean, they, they just have to go up. So some concerns going forward. Try to highlight some of these. We'll, we'll emphasize a few more. Uh, interest rates, uh, overbuilding, climate, uh, political climate. Um, Immigration laws, homeownership, we'll hit a few of these in the next. They think about interest rates. What do we hear? What's uh, what's uh, Chairwoman Yellen saying these days? Three or four increases this year. Okay. I, I think, think we'll go up a quarter point at least four times <coughs> between now and a year from now. I think we'll be at five and a quarter, five, maybe five and a half by this time next year. So the next three slides are really interesting. These are ones that Linda and Chris have put together trying to show the effect of interest rates on the value of your property. Yeah, um, we've, right now we, we have two lines, interest rates and cap rate. And you can see with the blue line is interest rates and the red line is cap rate. So there's about a two point spread. So you see at a four, at a, um, a four percent interest, it's about a six cap and it just moves up the scale. The second slide, we've added value. Uh, Last year, uh, at a 4% interest rate, which you could get, you could probably get 3.65, 3 and 3 quarters. Uh, at a six cap, your property is worth a million dollars. Okay, now you see, um, oh, we have it on this slide. As the interest rate goes up to five and a half, say that's the end of 2018, we're at five and a half, at a, at a uh, similar cap rate, seven and a half, keeping that two point spread your property value has decreased to 800000 It's something that just blew me away because, you know, we talk about the how, how are interest rates and cap rates, uh, how, are, how are they affected and what do they do, what do they do to value? And I really didn't think about it until you actually see the numbers right in front of your face. So if interest rates are starting to creep up, values are going to start to come down because your P&I is going to cost your, the buyer more, more money. So everybody kind of follow what we're doing. 
just was like, oh my. So. If you own a property today, you know rents are going up, but you know interest rates are going up. Do you, do you hold? Do you sell? What's, what's your flavor? A lot of people are in the same position out here. Yeah, they are. A lot of people on the fence. I must have 20 clients that say, oh, geez, call me in six months, you know. Uh, I, I love the cash flow. I had so many years where I wasn't making a nickel, and now I'm making good money. But they see interest rates going up. They see the buyer pool is starting to dwindle a little bit because values are starting to be so high that a lot of these buyers are being priced out of the market. And I'm talking about what we do, the 20 to 250 units category. I'm not talking about the big REITs that come in and buy Class A. So uh, if, if I'm an owner, I tell, I tell owners, my broker sold all of his properties last year. So I guess I've got to think that he's no longer on the fence. I did too. <laughs> but, but part of that was also yeah. that my partners were getting older yeah, and they, they were retiring. Retire. <laughs> um, Anyway, this is so, and then so one other concern. This was a, uh, a photo of the newspaper Arizona Republic a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm on the fence, so to speak, uh, about what's going to happen with Trump and immigration. Um, uh, we'll see. When we had the SB 1070 in 2010, combined with the economic downturn, we got slammed. Hopefully, that's not going to be the case this year. Hopefully, our, our diversity in market, our strength of our city is much stronger, and we won't get hit by something like an SB 1070. Um, something that, that hardly anybody tracks, and I think they should, um, is home ownership. And I'm going to make a point here, but the data that we obtained from for home ownership, there's nobody better at doing that than Alan Langston with Azria. I don't know if it, did Alan come in? Did he get here? No. So Alan Langston with with Azria, if you need his name or number, it'll be in the, in the handouts. But he tracks home ownership and statistics on home. If you have rental homes, I'm sure you're part of, you're part of Azria already. Um, we are at, and these numbers when they were presented by CoStar, thank you, Gina, um, uh, a couple weeks ago. We show home ownership here about 62.5%, something like that. And I thought, well, no big deal. Um, you know, if it goes up a little bit, but every percent that it goes up is about 40,000 people. Again, 1%, 4 million people, 40,000. Um, if we got to the norm back to 66%, if we went up a couple percent, that's 80,000 people. Now you take 80,000 people out of the, the apartment market and put them into the housing market. I think that's a big dynamic that we should pay attention to going forward as apartment owners. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, opportunities for buyers. Next, Chris. These are all good points, um, especially that first one, repositioning. I've said it a couple of times today. Uh, tenants are concerned about a couple of things. They want clean, safe, well-kept apartments. So and if you're looking for an apartment, um, we have the spot where we have a, a part we can get into the apartments for sale, Matt? So uh, yes. Okay, so see if Chris can do this, and, and I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. So we track uh, every advertised apartment complex for sale, 10 units or more, and sometimes smaller. Actually, a couple of the guys uh, will track the fourplexes and smaller markets in our group. Um, but we track these, we, we put them on a, on a list, we put them on a map uh, every week. And it's interesting when I say we, you have to understand that I really don't do anything. Uh, the people in the group do this for me. Yeah, yeah, Chris will do this. He'll put this on a map and it comes out like Monday morning or Tuesday morning. And then we put this on our website. So if you want to see where the new apartments are for sale, uh, we not only have a map, we have a list available for, for you to look at. So if you could hit this. And sure. these are not uh, just our listings. These are all that we're aware of uh, by all the houses in the valley. Nick? Right, so if you go to our website, uh, we have it right from our website. On the home page, there is a button that says exclusive map of available apartments. When you click this, it takes you to an area that asks you for your email address. Uh, it's simply so that we can uh, make sure that, that we're probably pro properly serving our clients. You enter your email address in, and it takes you to a page where you can click on the map. And you can also download the list. When you click on the list view, that gives you a PDF 
the map is interactive. When you click on the map, it opens in a separate window. This map is a lot less filtering than I showed you on the construction map. We're changing this out this week. So right now this only allows you to filter by the number of units, uh, but the new map is going to look like this. It's much more filtering. You can filter by unit range, by price, year built, uh, studio, uh, sorry, your unit mix, your zip codes, days in market, whatever you like. Uh, the same sort of principles are, are this functioning in this map. You click on it and you can see anything that is uh, known about this. These are all advertised apartments, 10 units and up. Clicking on the tooltip will give you the unit mix, uh, price per square foot, market, days on market, etc. Yeah. A great resource. What's the other way that you can find out what's for sale on the market? Yeah. Call us. Call us. Call us. Call us. Yeah. Call us. <laughs> And you can use LoopNet, right, if you're a CoStar member or go to LoopNet, that's a good resource as well, absolutely, yeah. But, but let, let the brokers do the work for you. I mean, use and abuse the brokers, that's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah. That's all I really had to say. There's a lot to filter on. Um, the lower left, some of the users in the back room can't really see this too well, but if you're really trying to get to know an area or you're trying to understand something going on around you, use the filtering tools. Uh, this map is also mobile friendly. It'll work on your tablet and your phone. Every week. Every, every week. week. Every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every week I personally update it and it's available mm -hmm. on Tuesdays. Chris, does it tell you if it's um, mm -hmm. under contract? So the question is, does it tell you if it's under contract? No. It's no, no. just those that are still advertised for sale. We'll go we'll research LoopNet other sources, we'll look at other brokers' uh, websites, um, anything that we know of. What we don't have on that list are things that are apartments that are not advertised for sale. Um, in general, how many apartments are sold that are never advertised? Oh, 40%. <laughs> so we tend to, we won't know every pocket listing as they call them out there. We will know as many as we can. Um, there are a lot of sales that never go to market. We are doing one right now. We had some folks come in yesterday, uh, Linda knows of a pop, uh, property, uh, 2830 units, something like that, Central Phoenix. It's like we wrote the offer of the LOI yesterday afternoon or something. Right. It'll never see the market. Right. One last final comment so on the map. Us. Understand that there's a lot of information there, uh, but if you have, want to learn more about any specific property, contact us. We can find out, and we do know a lot more than what's on the map. Thank you, Chris. So, Linda, crystal ball, where are we going? Well, the, like the like the slide says, there are there is continued pressure on rental rates and vacancy for new Class A. Uh, I'm not concerned about Class A. That'll work itself out uh, eventually because the people that are buying Class A have a whole different worry than us folks. Um, you know, if they can make more than uh, three quarters or one percent in the bank, they're happy as, <coughs> happy as can be. But I think that the, the market forecast for us is going to be that um, in the C and B properties, fundamentals are still good. Fundamentals are, are very good. Uh, there's no vacancy. Rents are still going up. Um, I'm concerned about interest rates. If I owned a smaller property, 10 to 30 units, I'd probably be thinking about selling and buying 30 to 50. Because I do believe in the long-term market, but I, I'm just a little bit concerned about this going beyond 2018. So. Uh, I, I think the C, the C properties are, are and, just and lower Bs yeah. have huge upside potential. We're going to have pressure on, on uh, no vacancies. There's no one building, and you can't afford to build because banks won't lend, on B and C properties. So the only way you get a B and C property is to once have been an A and then get old, and then all of a sudden you're no longer called an A, you're a B, and if you get older and you're well kept, well, you know, you just kind of go down the, uh, the pipeline. But B and C properties will never be built again. So uh, take advantage. Take advantage of those. Thank you. So that's our kind of market overview. Um, we're running a little bit long, but I hope everybody is um, okay with this. Uh, so I want to ask Scott Treaty, who's been with me for a number of years, uh, to come up and talk a little bit about, um, I'm not sure what he's going to talk about, but we have handouts <laughs> uh, about how to reposition properties, how to, how to increase cash flow and things. So um, Scott, if you want to stand, or I'm just going to hang out here, and, and then we'll finish after Scott is done. Uh, we'll have the panelists come up, uh, talk about landlord-tenant, 1031s, and repositioning assets. So, 
It's all yours. Scott Reed. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, real quick, thanks to Tom Simplot and Deanna with the AMA for putting this together. And <clears throat> thanks to a lot of the familiar faces out there, apartment owners and people in the service industry and the brokers and property management people. This is, this is what we do. And uh, it's good to see everybody here. Um, in front of you on the tables, we have some, some pretty pertinent information, and I just wanted to call attention to it. These are takeaways. Take them with you. Um, the one is called increasing cash or cash flow. Um, another one is maximizing value. And we also address retention. You guys can read this stuff later, but I wanted to call attention to a couple of things. Um, as apartment brokers, some of us own apartments too, and I've owned apartments for about 16 years. Uh, my wife and I have managed, owned, renovated, brokered, sold uh, apartments, and we've learned a few things that we think are probably helpful, pretty helpful for apartment owners. Um, for day-to-day -day operations and for cash flow, there's some owners that don't have much debt service on their apartments. They've owned them for many years, and they have no incentive to raise rents. And I understand that. They don't want to lose a good tenant. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to steer down the barrel of a, a two or $3,000 unit turn. So they're a little lazy on getting the rents up. I get that. But if not now, when? The market is rising. So to improve cash flow, um, I've got, there's a bunch of things on this list, but there's a few things I wanted to point out. And this is important. Um, why not get the most out of your apartment? I want to take a quick example. Any apartment owners, somebody raise your hand, I want to ask a question. Any apartment owners? This young lady here. Yeah. How many units do you have in your apartment? I have just four. Four units. Do you realize that if you raised rents $100 per unit, that $400 is $4,800 a year, that 4,800 would add approximately a six and a half cap would increase the value of your apartment building about 75,000. I, I have the highest rents in my neighborhood. Uh -oh. <laughs> 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 I get 900 for 900 square feet. There you go. So she's at a buck a foot. So they come and talk to me and ask me how I do it. I just say, I do it. <laughs> do what she does. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, a couple of things. Of course, Jim and Linda have been talking exclusively about BNC apartments. C apartments is where the money is at. Um, the big developers have all their different spreads and <laughs> dynamics and matrix, but the C apartments is where the money is made. There's a couple of things that you can do, and I want you to consider these. And these are some ideas and tactics also used by successful, effective management companies. But when you get a lease renewal, this is really good. The AMA lease, by the way, is the best lease, but uh, the best document to be used um, in my experience. Um, but you might offer small incentives, and these are, th these are great things. These, when the lease expires, your tenant is staring down the barrel of, do I move or do I stay? And the landlord comes to him and says, your rent's going up. Um, and the tenant doesn't want to pay it, and the landlord doesn't want him to leave. Truth is, a landlord, the tenant doesn't want to leave either. So you're going to raise their rents 150, 200 bucks. They've been there for years. You're way behind on the market. If they're not going to pay it, somebody else will. But they're going to leave, and you're going to spend money to make that apartment nice. Why wouldn't you spend money to make it nice to get them to stay? So you might incentivize them. If you're going to bump the lease, incentivize them. Get them some new ceiling fans, some bathroom vanities, um, maybe a new appliance package. Something to keep a good quality tenant coming along and just bumping the rent 100, 200, whatever a month, you're probably going to lose them. Um, incentivize them, take care of them. When you do raise your rents, know your competition. This is something management companies do all the time. Bob over here wrote the book on it. Know your market, and you can find out what everybody else is paying per square foot. It's a home run. Adjust your rents up. When the tenants threaten to leave, let them look around. <laughs> They're not going anywhere. Um, this is critical to the value of your property and the cash flow. The times are good. Like Linda said, there's no better time to be a landlord. Um, but I think perhaps the biggest opportunity going forward, and none of these slides showed it, today's children are pets. 
we all love our pets, and tenants are no different. I brokered a deal about two years ago where they all have little casitas in the backyard and a pet door. And I spoke to the new owner about a month ago. He's getting a dollar fifteen a square foot in a so-so part of town with mm, okay, see apartments. But because he caters to the tenants with pets, he's got pet deposits, he's got pet fees, he's got pet rents. This is a great potential. If you've got units that can sustain pets, I suggest you really maximize on it. This is an expanding market. A lot of empty nesters get pets. The kids are gone and pets don't talk back and you don't have to buy them cars and you don't have to pay them to go to college. So <laughs> the pets are great. Um, we have a pet program um, and the pet program at our little eight unit building brings in an extra about uh, 390 bucks a month. So I would highly encourage you to consider that. One of the other things about increasing income, you'd be surprised how many tenants are aware of water shortage in the desert. Some of the bigger properties are doing it, now I see the smaller ones doing it. We call it RUBS, RUBS. Um, it stands for the Utility Reimbursement. Set your rent rate. If you ask the tenants to pay an extra 25, 30 bucks a month for water sewer or for a utility surcharge, they don't bat an eyelash. They've been trained. You might find this an additional ad. I would highly encourage that you look at other ways to improve your income, and this is an easy one. Um, and of course, the last on the income uh, in my short list is late fees. Um, you start waiving late fees, they're going to keep being late. You start charging late fees, you're going to collect late fees. Um, but that's a big plus. Um, I just wanted to step to a couple of things here real quick on the expense side. And I can't speak for Tempe or Chandler, but those of us with apartment buildings in Phoenix, you might visit the City of Phoenix um, Water uh, Department website. You can download a sewer fee abatement form. <clears throat> sewer fee abatement request form is what it's called. When you complete this form, it's a one-page item, and sign it and send it in. You're sending into the city water department your property address and a request for them to conduct an audit on your property water consumption. You've got a swimming pool, you've got trees, grass, hedges, um, anything that absorbs water without returning it to the sewer. The city will come and conduct an audit and you are guaranteed to get a reduction on your sewer fee. They have to. It's a law. So I would highly encourage apartment owners, managers um, within the city of Phoenix to consider this as money on the table. Um, I've done it on four properties over the last few years. The, a 30 unit property we had, we enjoyed a $450 per month sewer fee reduction. That's five grand a year. That's some serious money. So, and if you're brokers or property managers, makes you look smart to mention that to your clients so when you can save them money. So I would highly encourage that. Um, a couple of quick things and I'll be done here. But I did want to mention some of us are considering selling as apartment owners. If you own now or if you plan to own, there will come a time to sell. And um, a good broker it cl clearly is going to help you get top dollar for it. Um, but a couple of things to consider. The obvious. You never get a second chance for a first impression, so you're going to want to make the property look sharp. You know, maybe a paint job or something. To, uh, trim the, the hedges and the bushes, uh, all the aluminum foil out of the windows, uh, make it nice. But, and this is a trick I learned from appraisers. I work with appraisers every day. Um, my job is to support value. My key role as a broker when working with owners is to support the strongest possible value in a sale, the highest net proceeds to the owner. Um, those are my marching orders. And I've learned a few things that are important, and I'm going to share those with you now. If you're thinking of going to market, you don't have to get all of your rents up. But get a few leases. Test the market. Don't be gun shy. They're getting $9.95 across the street. This young lady over here is the highest in the neighborhood, and she knows it. Um, Maybe you're not the highest in the neighborhood, but you don't have to have all of your leases at market. Leave a little meat on the bone for the buyer coming in. But if you can get a handful of leases at market, and try to get as high as you can, 
um, you say, whoa, well, 775 seems like, well, try eight and a quarter, try 850. Just do it. Two leases, two leases on a 20 unit apartment complex, it's 10%. Those two leases can give the appraiser all the ammunition he needs to support his discounted cash flow analysis projection for the upcoming year based on every lease expiration, they adjust the, the new unit up to market rents. And they're gonna use your lease as the guide. So if you're thinking of selling, um, we've got hundreds of great ideas to help you support value and getting your property ready for market to obtain top dollar. But one of them is get a couple of strong leases. This, this is a lot better than saying, oh, all the new guy has to do is raise the rents to this. That all you gotta do thing doesn't work. Set the mark, create that high water mark so that you've got something to demonstrate to an appraiser or a lender uh, and to a buyer and to the buyer's agent that it's possible to get that number. And uh, that and all of the other information we have to offer will help you get top dollar when you sell. So, uh, is there anybody have any questions I might be able to help with? Does anyone need any other copies of that sheet? Any extras? Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, it was funny. I'm just a story about. Uh, uh, so we have a, one of the fellows. You got a question? You got a question back there? Right here, right in the front. Uh, what do you think about keeping uh, a lot of the tenants on month to month? So the question, let me be quick. So the question is, what do you think about if you're going to sell a property, get keeping, them up high as keeping the tenants, keep yeah, get the rent as high as you can, but keep them on month to month so the new owner can come in and maybe refurbish the property and, and get the rents higher. That's the question. Yeah, that's a great question, and the answer is leave them month to month. Once you sign a 12-month lease, you've locked the new owner out of any potential rent increases on that unit. So. Month to month is great. Um, property managers, investors, uh, appraisers, lenders, when they come into a property and see a bunch of month to month leases, they in general like it because what it tells them is, especially in an escalating market like this where rent growth is the call of the day, the month to month leases are great because you can quickly um, 30 day notice them on a rent increase uh, as you wish. There's renovators in town, these value add guys, that come through, like, and Bob's doing a project for one of our good clients in, in the meeting tonight, rather than coming through and running all the tenants out and doing this wholesale renovation, the strategy is to keep as many tenants occupied as possible and selectively turn the units as they vacate. So it might take a year to, to upgrade the property, but they're maintaining that level of income as they're turning units. But the month-to-month -month leases gives that value-add player, that developer, that renovator, the month-to-month -month leases give them the power, the tools, to do it on their terms. And when time is money and you write a check to the bank every month for borrowed money, then that's very, very important. So to answer your question, yes, month-to-month. -month. Let them expire. Maybe jab them up another 25, 50 bucks when they go month-to-month. -month. And this is customary. If a tenant wants to sign a, a, a lease, only a month-to-month -month lease, Typically, you get a little more money. You bump that rent up as a convenience for the month to month. When they expire, let them run. If you're, especially if you're selling. Buyer comes in and all the leases are in the last two or three months and they run for another year, his hands are tied. So, very good question. Yes? Is there a shortage relative to demand? Is there a shortage relative to demand of furnished units? Hmm. We, honestly, we don't deal with um, much furnished uh, units. There are a few buildings downtown um, and in older parts of town that are furnished for um, subsidized income tenants, but we generally don't, we generally don't see furnished uh, apartments in this market. So, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, uh, it's really fun, if you can, uh, Scott's being quite reserved here. He's very animated, and, and it's fun, but it's really great when we have somebody come to us and say, I'm, I'm thinking about selling the property, and they turn them over to um, 
um, Scott or Linda or one of the group, and, and they handle, they, they take the person by the hand and say, this is what you need to do, and then six months later, then bring it to market. I see that we're running out of time. I said, Scott, thank you very much for your thoughts, and I, I'm going to invite the panel to come up here next. Okay, so we have the panel left, and, and again, I, 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 this is a great panel. I've already had two people um, today ask about somebody for 1031. I know that you always have uh, landlord-tenant concerns when, you, when you're a homeowner, and then the repositioning of assets to make a gold mine is, is the fellow in the middle. So, Denise, if you'd introduce yourself, kind of what you do, and a little bit about the company, which has been the best company in the city for years. Hi, I see a lot of uh, friendly faces. Thanks, guys. I'm Denise Holiday. Um, I'm with Whole Holiday and Holiday. We've been around for 40 years. Um, I've been around for 25 of those years. Um, we're known as Dr. Evictor. If you go to our website, it's free. Um, by the way, spell it out, Dr. Evictor. Um, someone told me if you just, just DR Evictor, it's a porn site, so that's not us. <laughs> we specialize in relocation services. Um, we've been around forever. So let me tell you a couple things that they, they asked me to talk to you about what I see as some really powerful issues. Um, I'm not only just an attorney, but I'm also a pro tem judge, and so it, that colors what I see and what I talk about. The two biggest issues that we're learning right now and we see with you guys is one, get educated, because your tenants are. They can find the law on their cell phone while they're standing in front of the judge complaining about whatever you did or didn't do, or creating whatever new story is that you did or didn't do. <laughs> And they can do it right from their cell phone, so you need to get educated. You need to go to good landlord-tenant classes. If you don't know anything, please go read the website. It's free. Use whoever you want to, but you need to know what the law is. There are two big things that just came down in fair housing, and if you don't know this, you're going to be in trouble. And what we're going to tell you is just don't say no. Say no to drugs, okay? <laughs> don't say no to a fair housing question because there's shoppers out right now that are coming to your properties and they plan on making about $5,000. And here's how it works. They call you and say, hi, I'm Bob. Um, I would like to come rent your property, but I'm a convicted felon, and I want to know if you'll rent to me. Now, you guys have been doing this probably a long time like I have, right? Our standard answer was, we don't rent to felons, right? We even ran our criminal felony history first, because it was the fastest. Right? I don't even apply, I want to take your money. Do you know that's illegal? In April of 2016, they came down with this, it's not a memorandum, but it's close enough to call a memorandum, which means they're going to sue you. They're sending shoppers and they're going to say, I have a conviction. If you say we will not rent to you, period, you will automatically be guilty of fair housing. And here's the reason why. They did a study in 2015 and they determined that there are some groups that are disproportionately impacted by arrests and convictions, and so we should be considering that when we're looking at a tenant and deciding if we're going to rent to them. We have to tie our tenant criteria to real life reasons we want to protect our community, and they have to be real reasons. So I understand as a, a landlord, your thought is, oh my gosh, how do I decide, are you a good felon or a bad felon? <laughs> Right? You don't know the answer. We've got an article on our website. The AMA's got a great article on the website. Please read it. Here's basically the answer. The answer is, the felony matters. Right? You, you know that instinctively. If it was a DUI, it's still a felony, maybe. It's not the same as molesting a child. We know that, and for some reason, when we became landlords, we just put on our blinders and said, no, felons. You can't do that anymore. You need to know when the crime happened. You need to know what the crime was. You need to know, did they complete their sentence? And you have to have a reason why that particular felony is what I'm going to call a bad felony. Arson. That's a big deal for us, right? <laughs> Do you care if they embezzle on their taxes? Do you care they stole 300 pairs of tennis shoes? I mean, he may not be able to pay his rent, but we don't, that's not our concern. Our concern is the safety of our property and the safety of other tenants, right? So please, just change your policy. Here's what you need to know that's the scariest, if that wasn't scary. They just put out into the market the largest group of shoppers they have ever had. Okay? There's a particular group that gets funding. They got the largest funding they've ever had 
in 50 years. And that's the newest issue that came up. So that's the first one. The second issue is, is just as complicated, and I'm sure you've already had the issue. Um, I want a pet 16-foot boa constrictor. Right? It's my comfort animal, and it hugs me. Or tries to eat you, whatever. But that's what they're going to say. They're going to come and ask you, I need a pet. It's not really a pet, it's a service animal. Number one, change your application. Did you ask? Does your application say, do you have a pet? Because if they say no, they're not lying because they don't have a pet. They have 14 service cats. <laughs> and you didn't ask. So they didn't have to disclose it, so you, you have to take them, right? Because you didn't ask. The second thing is you need to understand what do you not know about fair housing when it comes to animals. We had our first 400-pound assistive pig case in an apartment community. And that is a real case, and guess what? That animal was deemed to be a reasonable pet slash service animal because of the services that it completed. I can tell you, I was the attorney who took the case. Went to the property, they said, are you gonna come and see my pot belly pig? I didn't know much, I thought it was like a miniature chihuahua. Right, I didn't know that that was like a breed that got to be 400 pounds. Went to the property, manager said come meet me at the office or at the apartment 134 i'm like well one something means it's on the first floor that's good right? <laughs> we go there i knock on the door and the pig opens the door <laughs> and i scream like a little girl because it's in a dress and it has a hat it has a little necklace called miss piggy I'm like is your mommy home what do you say when a pig answers the door <laughs> i come inside i meet the landlord i meet the tenant she's Visibly, I can look at her and know she's impaired. So I don't need a note from a doctor, by the way, because I know that she's going to need an accommodation. You're allowed to ask some things. We've got a great article on the website, it's about five pages, explains everything about insurance and HOAs and all of that. But I need to know, does the animal perform a service, a task, or alleviate a symptom? That animal opened the door. Then she said, would you like a beer? I'm like, it's 9.15. <laughs> Do you mind? I'm like, it's your house, it's your pig, it's your rules. Pig went and opened the refrigerator and brought her back a beer. And because we do this for a living and you can't make it up, she says, Miss Piggy, it's before noon. I need a light beer. The pig went back. Oh. The, I'm like, my kids wouldn't do that, guys. That's a service animal. Right? That's a service animal. Now i got to think it's a 400-pound pig in an apartment complex. Where does it go to the bathroom? Right, have you thought about that? Who picks up the seeing eye dog's poop? <laughs> Gotta have that conversation. I need to know, is it reasonable? That's the next step. So I say, have you made arrangements for the animal's deposits? She says, you can't charge a deposit. It's a service animal. I'm like, wow, she knows the law, because that's exactly right. You can't charge a, a pet deposit, pet rent. There's no species restrictions, size restrictions. Even if your HOA and insurance says there are, there are not. So please make sure you understand it. If you don't, she said, come on back. She gets in a wheelchair. She actually reaches over and grabs the pig and spins around and takes the animal out. I would go over, and she's got the biggest cat litter box I've seen, about four foot by three foot. She has it cleaned twice a week. We have to allow that animal. It is a service animal. So if you don't understand that, you need to go to good for a housing class. You need to learn the law because they know the law. And it's an automatic fair housing violation if you say no, I won't rent to you because you're a felony, or you have a felon. I will not rent to you if you have a service animal because I don't think it's a proper service animal. Thanks. How about that? Huh? <laughs> I, I have a suggestion. So what, if you own an apartment, contract with these guys so they represent you. So if a tenant comes and wants to do a landlord and tenant act claim, you, you can, they can't go to this firm. You want them on your side. <laughs> All right, so Joe Callaway uh, is a 1031 specialist. Um, take it away, Joe. Thanks, Jim. Good evening, everybody. I, I've been with my company since 1999. Uh, it's our 25th year in business. One of the things that we do for a living is we teach accredited classes to attorney CPAs, real estate agents. Um, I, in fact, I teach an eight-hour class for attorneys and CPAs. And tonight I have five minutes with regard to code section 1031. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> so anyway, um, name of our company is Asset Preservation. 
Uh, we're a leading national qualified intermediary. <coughs> qualified intermediary is a company that facilitates 1031 exchanges based on the rules, regulations, safe harbor set forth by Congress and the IRS. I tell you that exchanges have exploded since 2013. We pretty much double our volume every month. So there's two reasons why. In 2013, for the first time in, I don't know, about eight years, people were actually realizing a gain, right? The other reason why is that capital gain tax went up uh, January 1st, 2013. They did. How many of you think they went up by at least 20%? Show of hands. I, I'm only up here for five minutes. <laughs> How about 30%? How about 40%? Capital gain tax went up by 58% January 1st, 2013. So again, exchanges have exploded. In five minutes, we really can't get into too much with regard to a 1031 exchange, or we'll cover one issue, the issue of like kind. It's a very confusing issue because the code says property has to be like kind, right? It's very, very misleading. As it relates to real estate, any kind of real estate qualifies for any other kind of real estate from anywhere in the country to anywhere in the country, okay? That means if you're selling an apartment building, can you buy land as replacement property? And the answer is yes, okay? Any kind of water rights, oil rights, mineral rights, easements. One of the things that Jim wanted me to touch on it is a DST, Delaware Statutory Trust. It's fairly new. Um, basically, it's a trust established in Delaware and the IRS has blessed this with, with a revenue procedure as it relates to replacement property for 1031 exchanges. So big companies, generally speaking, large sponsors form a DST. The biggest one in the business is called Inland Securities. <clears throat> so Inland just formed this DST and they went out and they bought a $60 million Walgreens portfolio, okay? They put the portfolio in the DST, and now they can sell it off on a fractional basis to investors. So you sell your apartment building, you're done managing uh, real estate, you buy a percentage interest of this $60 million portfolio, and it cash flows for you. You get all the benef benefits of actually owning real estate, even though it's sold as a security. Um, it's, it's become very, very popular. Quick, quick questions. And I'll be around as long as anybody wants in terms of, you know, questions or anything afterwards. Questions? All right, thank you very much. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, sir. The, the talk uh, last year about it going away, the 1031 going away, is that, is that out of the... So, the, that's the a table? great question. So, the question is, there's talk, there's actually a proposal, it's part of the blueprint, that Congress is currently proposing to repeal code section 1031 in its entirety, okay? So I've actually met with uh, Congressman Schweiker, I live in his district, um, with, we talked about it, I presented a whole bunch of facts that our association has come up with in terms of how this will so negatively affect real estate. In terms of investment real estate, 45% of all real estate sold is sold via 1031 exchange it will, the bottom will fall out of the market. So we're working hard right now to do everything we can. Call your congressman, tell him what you think about the repeal of code section 1031. Thank you for asking. Any other questions? Like I said, I'll be around. Uh, who, who is pushing for that? Who is who? Who's pushing for that repeal? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Who's pushing for the repeal, Joe? The House Ways and Means Committee. It's in their blueprint. If you well, go why? to- What people want it? What people? Why, are why do they? Oh, so why are they want to repeal? Okay, so, we're, so we want they want to bring down taxes, right? But they want it to be revenue neutral. So as a result of revenue neutral, <coughs> they want to get rid of, generally speaking, all of the tax advantages related to owning real estate. And that's part of the blueprint. You can go to the House Ways and Means Committee. Go to about page 13. That's where they start showing the specific elimination of, of whatever it is. Okay, that's a good question. Yes. Have they changed their position since uh, January 1st, 2018? So the question is, has, have they changed their position? This has been going on for a while. No, so no, the, it's still in the blueprint. So are they going to change that? Mm -hmm. What she said. 
are they going to change that, the blueprint? It probably will get changed. I mean, it has to get changed to some degree. But whether, I mean, I, you know, we part of the blueprint is the mortgage interest write-off as well. And I heard on, I heard from the new chairman today that, that wasn't going to happen. So part of the blueprint will change. We've we've made a big case uh, to keep Code Section 1031 as part of the blueprint. Yes. Yes. How is that going to affect us? We already have the. Tender exchange and LLC and all that. Repeat that, Joe, please. How's it going to affect you? The, the ones who have done uh, the tender one exchange. Have you already done an exchange? Yeah, into an LLC. Don't know. I don't. I don't know. There, all those rules and regulations related to how they're going to treat real estate if if this is repealed, they have to create because we don't know right now. Good, Joe. As I can tell you that if you've gone through 1031 exchanges and that kind of a thing, you know that you want to talk to a person like Joe up front, early in advance, kind of set your stage. You might want to do it like even a year in advance. I know there's some tax uh, things you can do if you change ownership, restructure it uh, a year in advance. So get these guys involved early on and tell them everything that you've got and let them lead you through the process. So Joe, thank you again. This, this whole evening is for resources for you guys. And we've saved, I can promise you, the best thought process for last, how to turn your C-quality property into a gold mine. So uh, Bob Myers is with Avant Garde. We've known Bob for a number of years. He has a client sitting here, Jim Carr, that he's working on one of his properties right now, 1804. Uh, it's on Tucky, uh, just near the light rail. So Bob, and I think we've got some slides for Bob as well. Chris, if you could pull those up. And Bob, you've got the last uh, foray here. Hi, everybody. This is working. Yeah. Hi everybody. My name is Bob Myers. Like Jim said, I uh, work with custom, uh, with uh, Avant Garde Residential Management Services. I'd like to thank Jim and his entire group at Caston Long. They're a wonderful group of people. I got introduced to Caston Long back in 2009 when I was in a 1031 exchange for a property in California, and we purchased here in Phoenix. Uh, it was an interesting time to purchase a property in Phoenix uh, because it looked like there was no tomorrow, but I was in a 1031 exchange, so I really had no choice. With the help of Captain Long, they suited me in a property that gave me an opportunity. Uh, even though the price was falling, even though the rents were not rising at all, what I was able to do was recognize an opportunity to raise my rents in a market that was not performing at all. And the way we did that is we just increased the quality of the interior of the apartments. Like you were, like they were talking earlier, there's a big movement right now for the, they say that 2017 is the year of the crane. Across the United States there are more cranes in the sky today building new buildings than ever before. Well what that does to us C property owners is it gives us that opportunity to compete with that new inventory. You see some of the numbers of new inventory, they're getting close to $2 a square foot on some of this stuff. It's ridiculous because the wages in Phoenix do not support $2 a square foot. Wages comfortably support $1 a square foot, $1.25, $1.35 a square foot. That's kind of our, our forte, if you will, in the C-sector properties. I took my C building and I invested maybe $10,000, $15,000 in each unit. I raised the price of the rent by $200 a month, and what it did for me is that $9,000, $10,000 investment that I made was now worth $35,000. It was an amazing thing. So I go to Jim Cass and I said, Jim, I got this formula. I says, I think it's 17 to 1. And when Jim and I took a look at it, he says, no, Bob, you got the decimal point in the wrong place. It's 170 to 1. What that means, if you do the simple math on a cap rate, and you take $100, and increased uh, uh, rental per month, you got that annual, and you do the 7% cap rate on that amount, it's going to rise out about $17,000 in value, increased value. So like Jim said, I have a couple of clients in the audience today, so we do have proof. We have some photos up here, some before and after shots. Most of the C buildings, they look like your before shot here on the left hand side. You know, they're Dated kitchens, dated bathrooms, you know, the whole apartment is about 1950s, 1960s. We're going in, 
and spending about $20,000 on this particular unit, doing a nice Ikea kitchen, doing some backsplash, doing the brush nickel finishes, the six panel doors, and we're seeing that these rents are going up from a two bedroom in this particular building was at $750 when we took over in May. Today we're now getting, we landed a deal today, Alan, at $990. So we've increased that $200 easy all day long. I've done it myself, I've done it for others in this room, and Avangard would love the opportunity to talk to anybody here that wants to know more about this process. It's all about giving people value for their money and they can afford this dollar to a dollar twenty-five cents a square foot in the city all day long. Um, I'll be around. I've got a lot of my people that work with Avangard. Anthony D'Augustine, our president broker. Alan Tejeda, he's our lead uh, leasing agent. Stephanie, she is one of our uh, top uh, uh, managers, on-site managers in, in our buildings. We offer full service management as well as repositioning your properties to make you a profit upon sale. So thank you again. We really appreciate everybody coming out and spending this time with the AMA, with Caston Long, and Avangard. We want to be your team. Call on us. We're there for you. Thank you again. Bob, did you want to go through the lights? I'd like to show you a couple more, just a couple more shots. There's Tom Mayer, his building on uh, uh, Verage Elaine. This is a before and after shot there. Blew out some walls. Did some backsplash, did some you know solid plywood cabinets, you know, reasonably priced, some um, uh, stainless steel equipment. And again, we're spending about $20,000 a unit on Tom's building as well. There's some bathroom shots. It just makes all the difference in the world investing in your building. And you won't lose your clients by doing this. Like Jim was saying earlier, we have properties where I have raised rent $200 on, eight, on an eightplex building and not one of them moved because we went and we talked to them and we told them what we were going to do for them and to get, that, get the quality of their living experience a raise. Here's just some ideas here. You'll see all this on their website, like they said, but it's a before and after. You look at the rents of a two bedroom was average about 691 and now they're about 950. So what that does at the bottom line, your NOI, is it brings you up to about what, where you purchased a property for maybe 1.3 million, you do a little bit of increase of the uh, uh, quality and you're up about 1.9 million. It definitely pays for itself. It's definitely something to look into, and we can help you get there. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. That's it. So a, a big hand for all the presenters today. <laughs> so just in closing, a thought again. We do this for a living. We do the brokerage. We do an evaluation of the market. We're watching things. We're watching trends. We try to be a resource for every apartment. Or we've done that. That same goal, that same philosophy is lending itself right into the IRO group with the AMA. Um, so we are happy to be, again, partnered with Tom and the AMA. We are here as a resource. The, the entire program tonight is what can we do to help you? If you have questions, call us. If we can't help you, if we can give you to another person, the co-star, the Yardie people, the Azaria people, the more AMA people, whatever you need that we might not be able to have, we're happy to provide those references. The, a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and some of Bob's slides will be on our website, hopefully on the AMA uh, website. Again, guys, thank you very much for your attendance. And what I need from you is ideas for our next quarterly meeting. What do you want to hear? How do you want to have it structured? We're here to serve you guys. Again, thank you. Great to see everybody.